Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Cinedome's podcast, Cinephiliacs. I'm your co-host, Daniel Scott DeJess, and with me is... A.K. Hey, founder every- and owner of Kiara Pictures. Hey, hey, A.K. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. How you doing, A.K.? I'm doing good. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad you're glad to be here. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> hey, we, you know we have a great guest today? We do? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Who is it? Uh, everyone, please give... Jazz hands for our lovely guest, Chris oh. Eaton. Uh, thanks for being here, Chris. <laughs> uh-huh. Chris, no, seriously, we appreciate you coming on. Um, so obviously, uh, we are going to be talking about your involvement in film programming and mm-hmm. being a film programmer for for specifically the Sunscreen Film Festival, but in, fe- in festivals in general. Um, so just to start off, um, kind of briefly talk about how you got into becoming a film programmer sure um i had uh i've had a very diverse um professional portfolio (laughs) of doing all kinds of things and uh when i ended up back in st petersburg after living uh in central america for a while uh, i was involved in some political uh campaigns and didn't quite play out the way that i'd hoped Turned out that I had agreed to screen as a volunteer for the Latin American film festival portion of Sunscreen and had gotten to know uh, the previous programmer. And then he left. He's now a a big producer. And um, the guy they were going to hire wasn't available and they needed somebody. So I think I got the job because I was a breathing, functioning person (laughs) that was available and and how bad could you do this right so um but i didn't know what i was doing and my experience the only thing i could lean on is uh for the past a uh, decade prior to that i had been pretty immersed in the art world the visual art world um and had gone to art fairs and had sat with curators and artists had 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 them at my home so i understood like the idea of curating and I realized that that's what I was being called to do at sunscreen so I dove in and I remembered the first question the first question I had was uh, I remember asking somebody who was a programmer "Uh, do we actually watch these or what I mean there's a lot of films and like oh yeah if people pay they watch so my philosophy was er anybody who pays to submit um, their film will be watched so when you call and bitch about how your film didn't get in, it'll come right to me and I can tell you why it didn't get in, you know. So uh, and then I utilized screeners and then, you know, there we go. So it turned out that I had a knack for it, I guess, and um, I would end up doing it for three years. And then COVID sort of shifted everything and many things shifted as a result of that. So and now I do, I help with programming for uh, 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 Greenlight, which is a new art house cinema in St. Petersburg. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the difference... You are, you know, you're a big part of curating the content for this art house. And I, I know Mike Hazlitt, the owner, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's very adamant that you guys show the best cinema in yeah. the world. So um, what's that like going from sunscreen where, you, you know, the, right. the submissions right. are all... Con- every, well, every- at the film festival, for example, at a film fest, it was a shift because I thought I understood the movie industry, but I understood the movie industry from the film festival side. Once we moved into a professional movie house, the, then you're looking at, you're dealing with distributors. So when you're at a film festival, you're, unless you're Sundance, uh, Chicago, Tribeca, TIFF, where most of that is distributor mode, you know, led, uh, sunscreen, the indie, the festivals, film Florida, all of these, you're dealing with independent films. So these are probably budgets under 10 million, under 5 million. Uh, indie films, low budget. They, sh- they come to the festival in a van, sleep in tents, you know. And then you go from that to the films that have now reached distribution. Right. And you're looking, your criteria is similar but different. So, for example, um, I was asked to watch, screen a film yesterday for Mike uh, from one of our distributors. The name's not important. It was part of Tribeca. So I watched it, and my comment afterwards was, indie film, well-made, good film, played at Tribeca, did well, no-name actors. Um, and I wrote, 
this would be a festival darling. Like if I was running a festival, I grab this one and I feature it on a Saturday night, try to get some of the actors to come in. But you're asking how many tickets I can sell for this right. in this town, in this market, at this theater. I can only give you this number on this shows. This will be a hard lift. So I would pass, right? Even though it's a good film, I'm not sure I can sell the tickets. Mm. So it shifts your thing. For but sure. even at sunscreen, uh, once we programmed, then I told my marketing staff, which I was part of, Spearheading 2, which is we now have the content sell the content and when screeners would make a pitch for a film like oh i want ak's film in my question would be i'm okay with that just tell me who the audience is tell me describe the profile or tell me who the person is because if you can't tell me who's going to be in the theater then i don't believe you believe in the film right so yeah so that's the difference one yeah. is more indie and then one's more you know the our art uh, the the art house in but some of those are indie i yeah, mean you no, know but sure. they've reached a critical level of getting distribution a, a, has it been more enjoyable the fact that you know working for no. um no it's been less enjoyable working oh. for a theater than a film festival interesting interesting mm. so it has nothing to do with the personnel of the theater it means that you're deal because you can only get what you can get yeah you can only get what they give you, and you can only get what you can live with with the terms of what you're getting. So we're not going to take at a single theater art house. You can't commit to take a film for four weeks. Yeah. You know? And because what if, you know, what if it's a dog, right? And then you're stuck with the dog and you can't sell, or they want you to have two weeks. Yeah. And it's really, really hard and you have that. And then sometimes there's just not, con there's been periods in this whole COVID phase where I haven't always been proud what we've put out, but that's what we could get um, based on what was available. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah. I guess, I, I guess my, my question is, you know, from the artistry side, you know, so Sunscreen is an established film festival, but it's not currently Sundance or no, it's you know not, so right. same so, with Gasparilla. Yeah, that they're so, not. Yeah, they're not that level. I mean, the closest, the most significant film festival in Florida would be Film Florida, right? Which would be, I, I think over. I think it's Film right, the one in Orlando. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then Miami, and then you know, and so we're, uh, you know, and we lean heavily into. And, and remember, at Sunscreen, I couldn't pay. Um, I couldn't, I had no money for fees. I couldn't pay screening fees for anything, which became problematic for European films because that's not how they roll. And yeah. so uh, it, that, in that part, it became more difficult. But there's, a, there's an endless number of indie films out there looking for opportunities. And in a film festival, an indie film festival like Sunscreen, you're trying to champion champion emerging artist. So my thing was I was looking for those who might if I book them now, this is a good film, but I'm betting they're going to they're headed someplace and then, you know, 5 years from now, yeah, when they're winning awards, they still owe us. Right, because we gave them the got chance. Got it, got it. So it's it, it, in... in You don't have that in, kind of relationship with a movie theater. You don't create that. Yet. That's right. very, that's a very interesting. I've never actually heard of that before, but it's programmers in many ways not all the, programmers do that but yeah it's, you want to be a champion of your so you're you're really you're investing in the potential yeah of, of I, that's of, how i approach it i'm not yeah. saying that's the philosophy now or so for example the first year uh i'll give you an example the first year we i booked a film and actually i watched it it was one of the last features i watched because it had the worst horrible terrible name and it had a budget of less than $10,000 and the director was 19 years old. So oh, it's cool, like, cool. oh dear God. But they paid the, you know, whatever it was to submit. So I'll suck it up and I'll watch it. And I watched it and I'm like, oh my God, this kid, this is, this kid's got talent. I don't know how he did this for 10,000. And I booked it. And so uh, on opening night, you know, it's when I would meet many of the filmmakers for the first time in sunscreen we get a lot of filmmakers in because we do the workshops and that was the whole idea is to try to get them to come 
And I would just walk around and say, don't tell me your name, just tell me your movie because I remember I remember yeah. the first time I met you, yeah. he did the exact same yeah. thing. He's like, look, look. Don't I'm like, he's like, I'm not going to remember your name. But he's tell like, me your movie. What's and the... then I could talk yeah. with you. Oh, I'm like, oh, I liked how you did this. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. met uh, Wilder was his name. And I'm like, oh, my baby director, look at this. And I go, honestly, I almost didn't watch your film because it has the shittiest name I've ever. It's like a terrible name. Mm -hmm. And your budget's so low. Yeah. And he's like, I know. So let's rename it, please. And so I took the big dog directors all, made them come and watch the baby director thing and they're like this kid's got talent and then together i came up with a new name he retitled it and then he got into film festivals so wow. and then he's been back now and i still i'm interacting with him so you still try to champion that emerging talent and my deal was just remember when you win your oscar just give us a shout out right <laughs> hey yeah. sunscreen right or yeah. you know whatever so no, but it... you tried because that's all you could do because you're not going to get Mer people would say oh who's coming well it ain't meryl streep it's not al Pacino. like you know we have no money you know yeah, and yeah. so i'll name some stars but you'll recognize them but you won't know the name right, right. so you're leaning in a different direction well, I think it just that little the story you talked about there is like goes to show kind of how important it is, how even a name of a film has to be yes. as impactful as anything else, because that almost prevented you from you know from from watching it. Well, and then if you hadn't, you know, that wouldn't have gotten in. I, I think something that a lot of filmmakers don't um, realize is that every festival has a brand, and there's a certain yeah. programmatic element to like if this doesn't match, you know fit all the P's and Q's, if it doesn't check off all the boxes, well, it could it, be a great film, but it's just, it's, exactly. it's not going to be also, a fit. And that can change from programmer true, to programmer. Yeah. So you have to think of your programmers as curators. So yeah. when you go to see a, uh, when you go to see a new exhibit at a museum or a new art opening at uh, Pinellas Creative that have been curated, you're, that's being you're you're sort of being guided by the curator so it's their taste or their focus so you really need to not only lean into the brand of the festival but you want to spend if you're going to the festival spend time with the programmer yeah and one night i remember having uh, i was at a uh, there was a party a cocktail party or something and and i go you know i was standing in line and i'm like well Somebody buys if if somebody will let me get into the front of the line here and get a drink, I'll tell you how I choose films. And then all of a sudden, there was a gathering <laughs> of, of <laughs> the seas parted. They, yeah, they yeah, parted, yeah. and the yeah. ones that cared, they're like, "What?" And I'm like, "Oh, I do this. Oh, I read those letters." They're like, "You read those letters? Oh yeah, people send letters like, oh, I lost my virginity in St. Pete. I'd love to come back.'" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll book that. That sounds great." <laughs> so you. There's awesome. all these different things that I look at. I look at budget and I'm like, and these are the yeah, things yeah, that yeah. I can't live with if it's, if you, you know, there's, these are the things. And then I think I eventually did a seminar for Film Florida over in Orlando where I just talked about this is what, these are the things I kept in mind. And this can make a difference on how you get into a festival. Yeah. So in, well, it, I just want to say something. Yeah. In many ways, a programmer is, is, like a chef, you um, know, they're preparing the palate. Like a high, a yeah. fine dining chef yeah. who's creating dishes. Course, right, the, exactly. Yeah. So I would say nobody knows. Um, the last program I did at Sunscreen, I actually wasn't, you know, they eventually did it during COVID and I wasn't there. But I said that nobody, I had a, in my mind, there was a guiding direction I was going from opening night to closing night. I had. In my mind, I knew exactly, because I put together all the shorts in those groupings. So you took a hundred shorts and you put them in groupings and all of that, no one person could see everything. But if you did, you would have to be clueless not to get the agenda and the messages that I was burying in That's there really to cool. try to change your attitude. Yeah. So for me, it was a chance to shake people up or push the envelope or do those things. You don't quite get that with a at an at a movie theater because you know you're driven by we got to sell tickets, right. sell the popcorn. But you're hoping when you do have a film, I still enjoy hanging out there and saying, "Oh, what you think of everything, everywhere, all our living, or corsage, or did you see how the performance and the direction, and did you see the cinematography in EO or whatever?" Mm -hmm. I enjoy that, but it's a different dynamic than a festival. How I approach festivals, I'm not saying that's, really that's cool. everybody.
Yeah, well... And obviously, since I'm not currently employed by any festivals, maybe that's not the way you're supposed to do it, but that's what I did, yeah. Well, when you when you were the film programmer, what were some of the easiest, I guess, mistakes you maybe saw like film submissions make or filmmakers make in terms of like that you were just like, this is, you know, yeah. it didn't make it in, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like yeah, broad or, things or yeah, like adjust. Like if they had made this adjustment, they yes. would have been more likely. Yeah. Um. So let's talk about indie filmmaking. Yeah. Um. And also, what's been interesting though, um, that I would tell you is, you know, and we're also running acting classes at with Eugenie Bondurant at uh, shout out Eugenie Bondurant and Mary Rachel uh, Quinn and Rochia. Mary Rachel so, Quinn. And we're doing improv, and we have like 60 people in classes. So, um, But I hammer all the time, as is Eugene, that I'm amazed that people who want to be actors don't go see films and see actors. Mike brought that up right? yesterday. You want to yeah. be a filmmaker? then go, Like, if you want to write, read books. Like, you don't meet writers who have like, really? Tolstoy? I've never heard of him. Hemingway? What is that? I've never heard of that, right? <laughs> so it's like, you want to be a filmmaker? What have you seen? Oh, I saw Maverick. Oh, big deal. Yeah. But that's not you. You're not going to make Maverick. You don't get five, $200 million budget. So true. You're getting a million if you're lucky. So see those films, right? And learn and study. So, uh, well, I forget what you asked me now. I went on the riff. <laughs> no, I mean, that's oh, kind oh, of... So, okay, so films that don't make it. So when you come to indie filmmaking where everybody's so ambitious and they got their thing, they're going to make a film. And I always begin by saying this, and the same thing I say in the art world, which gets me in trouble, but I'll say it locally, is that just because you do art doesn't mean you're a good artist. And just because you do art doesn't mean you're a working artist. If your mom wants to hang your finger paints on the refrigerator, good for you. How? But go get a job because yeah. you're not, that's it, you yeah. know? And just because you got a camera and you want to make so a film, good. if you keep making shitty films, you're a shitty filmmaker. That's the reality. So, I love this. This is the best. So this is one of my the favorite re- So the reality <laughs> is, so good. the reality is, number one, I can live with almost anything but what one thing, AK, in film production, could you not live with if you're a programmer or the audience. What one technical error can you not live with? Messed up sound? Yes. Yeah. The messed up sound. Oh, yeah. And sound is sound is the biggest thing that keeps because if the sound's not working, you may have a good script. Yeah. I may like I like the script, yep. which is an accomplishment in and of itself, mm. which is also lacking sometimes. But you have a good script. You even have some good performances, but the all I hear is the birds outside, or I can't hear the person. But don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, so that's like this. But the sound, so sound, um, the inability to. I have grown to have. Um, if I were to come back in life and be something different, I would want to be an editor because. Mm. Editors are the ones that really make the film, and really good editing can take subpar, can take almost a a marginal script, marginal performances. You still got to have decent sound. That's like, but if you have decent sound, and it can kind of make it into something. And so an editor should know cut, 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 length. Yeah, pacing. Don't give me these 40 minute short films. Like, if you can't do it, in 15 minutes you got a problem you know it's like anybody a monkey can speak for an hour it takes talent to speak for five minutes so these types of um editing uh, but sound is the big one and then script really just have somebody look through the script read it but i see this on uh big releases too you're like did anybody work on the script like what what where did that come from so yeah but those would be the but sounds yeah Mm. So with with um, I guess to be and I had to take a lot of local, so that yeah. was my obligation. And there were times where like, okay, you were like, to, to be, see, I would like to put a nail through my eyeball, but I'll do it. <laughs> and you try to take the best of the worst, yeah, you yeah. Know? And, and, you and you're like, watch, like you said, you watch them all, so like someone has to do it. Painful. And like, us going to the festival. There are films where you're we're... like, you're like this. You're just you're <laughs> going through it, and you're like, <sighs> it's like. <laughs> Fingernails on a chalkboard oh, with man. water torture going on. It's like everything happening, and you try, and the film's only ten minutes, but it feels like it was maybe a whole lifetime. Oh <laughs> wow, man! I've definitely watched so, a few of those. T- 
talking specifically about deliverables, yes. right? So not the, the production side, but what are things that affect a submission, mm -hmm. you know, like having cover art or a trailer or um, a director. For a film festival. Uh, yeah, for a film festival, like a director's, did in, having a good um, director's mission, yeah, so mission I, statement. I, right, or, exactly. So um, you would get, uh, if we were using um, Film Freeway for submissions. So not all the screeners would have complete access. So if, because I've seen that where I judge for Gasparilla and I have access, but I don't have all the... Um, I don't have the financial data and the, the submission letters and things like that, which is better because I shouldn't be influenced in judging by any of that. But the, um, you, I, would, I, would, I would look at the film. I would also look in, if it's played anywhere else, right? So if mm -hmm. I knew that there are festivals I know of. So if you said, hey, we got into the Katmandu Film Festival, and I'm like, uh-huh, right, who doesn't? You know, and how was that for you? Did you go to climb Everest while you were there? So you would look, but when they were in like like New Orleans, Miami, Woodstock, Montclair, you know, Dallas, you know, you would see they had a few. That meant other programmers believed enough in the film to submit it. Now I've done that and I realized, oh, they did that because that film was local because this is a really bad film. So they put it in, right? But that would be a number one. Number two, I would look at uh, the director's mission statement, and occasionally uh, they would write a letter to us. You know, I love sunscreen, or you're great, or I was there, or if I, if you're an alumni, if you've been before, you kind of get a, you know, you get a point, right? You almost, it's hard to turn you down if you've been before, because once you're in, you're in, you know, right. kind of thing, and. Um, uh, budget wouldn't be an issue, but it would be, you would look, so you would look for if it's played anywhere, if it has any cachet, if it's, it, what's the director done before? Right. Because um, remember, you're looking for emerging talent. Yeah. And then you're looking for a mix of thematics. Things. So if, if a programmer, if a festival is using Film, free, f film Freeway. freeway yes. Could say that the, three times fast. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the film the, freeway freely the <laughs> the programmer will have like a, a dashboard or something where they'll be able to see everything everything you submit i can see the budget if you submit it i can see that if there's distribution but you can also that. so but you can also you see the other festivals that it was submitted to if they put um they'll usually note it Right, so they slap those um, laurels up as oh, soon as, like yeah, you know, the, the, the you know, wheat, you call it. laurels oh, and film festival remind me of of pushing and shoving and diving for beads in Mardi Gras. Like <laughs> they love laurels and they can't get them, and they want I me, and they they can't get enough of them, and they slap them up, and they'll notice if you get your film into like New Orleans Film Festival or the Miami Film Festival. If you're a Florida film and you got into Miami. You're gonna to want to let me know that because it'll draw my attention. Well, that, so that's attention. that's a but that's a good point. So you a pro programmer won't know what other festival what other festivals it's been into yeah. unless unless they put those laurels, you know, or, or unless they tell me if they can gotcha. say it and it's submitted. Um, and that some like so at some point you'll reach film. Some films come to you towards the end, and like one year I had two animated films that were in our the animated slot both of which were nominated f for oscars for in the short animation category mm. which is like lucky us well those were easy to choose i mean the by the time i was getting them you could see film like you know four four f 15 wins you know so many they, they had so much pedigree so so uh, uh, i guess I, I i question just because it's it's it looms in this industry how are you able like what if someone just creates a laurel and is like hey my film made it into sundance but actually didn't oh well like, then how, you would yeah I, mean, uh, I have never seen that but i guess it could happen but that yeah. would be um because you would if you say you won sundance yeah i'm gonna go look at the website i'm gonna make sure you won Sundance, you right, know, right. and I mean, you'd have to be like, that's George Santa's stat, stat, status of lying where you're just making up stuff. Yeah. But I didn't find, I didn't find, I found that the problem with filmmakers, they probably weren't selling it enough. 
Interesting. Like they okay. make it, and then usually it's good for them to have their producer should be the one who is. That's a producer's job because the filmmaker is more the creative, or they wrote right. the script, or you know they they sold their car to make the film or whatever. And now whoever their producer is should should help out with that. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So so in in a in a perfect world, programmers if they're coming across, uh, you know, because. On the filmmaker side, when we're submitting through Film Freeway, yeah. you know, we have a dash. We see all the festivals that we've submitted to for that particular project. We see whether it's been, you know, accepted, denied, or... Yeah, see, sad. I've never seen that, so okay. I don't see your side of it. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, that's, that's a, I think, an a important point, because, I, I, you know, I, I think uh, a lot of filmmakers are curious, like, you know, uh, we see you know that a film's momentum has, you know, perpetual effect on yes. getting into other, right, other, exactly. other, other festivals, right. you know, but how do the programmers find out about that success? Do they have access to the, 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 the you know, the, the website, the back end of, and then so you, well, it's you a filmmaker has to tell you. Yeah. yeah. If yeah, they so don't tell me, I don't have time to go research like every film festival to see where your thing's been in. Yeah. And you're right. It create. it's almost like uh it's like a avalanche or a snowball. You know, as it rolls, it's going to get bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger. And you want to sell, you're, you're selling a product, right? And yeah. so when we talk about the creative aspect of filmmaking, which is what a lot of your guests have done, now we've moved to the stage of monetizing it. Right. And yeah. so with indie filmmaker, the film a lot of the indie filmmakers make is they may, if they're lucky, pay back their investors. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But it's not yep. going to be the big. But their value to the greater market is I liked what I saw here. And now some somebody with money is like, I'll put a quarter million into your next one, you know. And so the success of uh, my films got into 40 festivals and that. Yeah. It, that means you're betting on the future. So there's all this emerging talent out there, and we're just trying to find it. The, the reason why I was hyper focusing on that is because I think it's really beneficial, you know, for filmmakers to to know about. Like, you need to be talking in your 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 cover letters or what, like how the film is doing. Yes. And who you partnered with, if there's any or you know organizations involved. Rather than a lot of filmmakers, I think, I mean, I can talk to me specifically. I just talk about the story, you know, but you're not thinking about really the no. the business side, the marketing, the business side. Help of me it. market it. Yeah. And especially that comes, yeah, that's even more true when you talk about feature or feature documentaries or short, uh, short film documentaries. So there you've chosen a theme, right? I'm going to do a documentary on um, uh, veterans. Uh, loss of limbs, or I'm going to do a documentary on on uh, mothers or on prisoners or whatever it is. So then you help me think of documentaries are the easiest films in many ways because I'll book them. I would book them if I thought I could find that market, mm. right? Who are the people that care about this subject, right? And I try to lean into that for that. When you were programming, were later films in the review process needing to be more enticing to you or more impactful because you had already watched, you know? Well, you hope that you, you take copious notes. Um, uh, and remember, I would choose, I had a whole screening team that I put together. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, but that's basically, I think when I write my memoir, it'll be called unqualified because I've been unqualified for everything I've done. So <laughs> I, you know, so I figured, okay, um, I would ask screeners what they wanted to watch and then I would lean into them, you know. So if I had somebody that only watches horror, watch it because I have other people that they have a panic attack if a donkey gets hit with a switch. Oh, <laughs> then they have to, their chakras are all in line yeah. and they have to go get a massage and they're out of it, you know. So, um, or they can't take this or they don't like rom-coms or like there's certain kinds of genres I can't stand, but I'll watch them. But I prefer to have other people watch them to give me a, a better assessment. So, um the so you would um, you you would hope that everybody would take good notes and you would review the notes because it's more the films that you're seeing in August who are getting in that early zone that you've got to remember yeah. when you start because remember you're taking six months more or less unless you're 
you know, if you're organized, which isn't always the case, but ideally I would start in August for a festival in April, which means I would have to let everybody know their submissions were chosen by February. So you have six, seven months. You got to remember those early films. The late ones, um, the late ones are the ones that are usually going to come are the freshest, are the ones that are just completed um, and are just coming out of post-production. And so those are the ones that you know you might be able to ride the tiger, so to speak, mm. because the other ones are completing their cycles. These, one, these, these newer ones might have a run and they might go someplace. So let's, let's talk about, like, so talking about, I guess, the, se the season or the, the cycle, if you're going to execute a feature film, I, ideally, when, what month, you know, or what time, what quarter or month should you try and have your feature done by so you can jump onto the, the festival? Well, I would bandwagon. think that your, um, I mean, part of that submission fees add up, as you know, mm -hmm. okay? And, yep. you know, from doing so, it can add up quite a bit. Yeah. And a lot of filmmakers are like, oh, I needed a budget for that? And then they get mad. Like, I can't believe you're charging me fees. I'm like, okay, we have... It's a business. How do you... It's a business. Like, how do we yeah. make... Like, <laughs> we don't have any money. Like, what do you want us to do, yeah. right? And it's like 15 bucks, you know? But I understand it adds up. So you got to choose those. And make sure when you submit... First of all, don't submit hey, it's not quite finished. Here's a rough draft. You don't want me looking at a rough draft where exactly. you haven't corrected the sound, right? So don't have me go. I, then I have to really see this glimmering, glimmering little speck of miraculous talent in the midst of shit that you haven't cleaned out in post-production. So mm. submit it when it's ready. I say submit it early. If you, It's the cheapest fees. And if your film's good, it's going to stand out. Right. If you believe you know, in your film, it's still going to do its job. It's going to stand out, and uh, it should stay with that programmer. And and choose, and then, you know, there's there's big film festivals, the big dogs, which people want to get in, which are hard to get in, and uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly because they're contro controlled by industry. And then there's the filmmaker film festivals where, like, we, we really want to, uh, you know, my thing was I want to champion you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to promote your film when it's playing somewhere else, all that. And then there's film festivals that just show films, right? And they don't really care if you're there or not. So you got to figure out what you want and, and what you're going to. And, you know, and why not go for a couple qualif uh, Oscar qualifying if you're doing shorts? You might get in. Maybe you win. Then you're qualified, you know? Who knows? It can happen. I mean, in the three years I did things for sunscreen, and I don't know, watched 1,200 films probably for those three years to get to the selections. I had three Oscar-nominated shorts come, up, come across my path. And so they're rare. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't think there's a time. If your film's good, it'll stand out. But don't send it until you're ready. When people talk about festival run, like... Uh, is is could that run happen at any given time during uh, a year or is there like i guess what i'm asking is there a more preferred time of like hey well you have to base it on like certain everybody gets in their mind like hey i'm making this film and i'm submitting it to sundance and you're like uh-huh okay well good luck you know and maybe yeah. get in which is fine to do but don't bet all your apples on this 500 dollars short 20 minute film about dogs with curly tails, you know, yeah. then you think it's going to get in. But um, I don't know if there's a time. I think you just, I think you have to have a strategy that is part of your post-production. So you would say, what's our budget? What are we going for? What can we probably get? And what is our far, our, let's reach high, but then let's be realistic and then put, the, then execute your plan. And, and I don't know when that is, you know. And I, and I think also. And some festivals require, sorry, yeah. some festivals require world premiere, Florida premiere, yeah. United States premiere, Southeast premiere. So like Sundance, you don't get in unless it is a premiere, right? So you don't blow it by going to a really teeny festival, which then negates. I mean, I would run into that here. People would submit here and I'm like, no, you're not getting in. Why? You played 
Underground, Dunny, <laughs> Sunshine. You've played 50 times. Come to us. We're the big dogs. We get you first or you don't play. That was my yeah. position. Well, I remember, I'll, I'll never for, forget, guys, um, when I had uh, a conversation with Chris about film festival strategy. And he's like, look, he's like, submitting to a film festival, it's like being at a bar. Um, and you want to make sure that you're hitting on the attract the most attractive person at the bar first and, and, and that you don't just shotgun out right. your your film to right. every film festival under the sun because if that really attractive great catch finds out that you're trying to bed them and every and then some yeah, everyone else in the and bar everyone else then they don't want you anymore which is great so, advice considering I'm so horrible at that but yeah. anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> how I could ever execute that I have no idea but uh, yeah that's yeah. true so you but you have to choose your strategy you don't choose one film festival and then wait and find out while. 10 others go, you know, and so, and realize and be realistic. I mean, come on, you know, if it's your first film, uh, I mean, it's an exceptional talent where all of a sudden you're going to Sundance, you win, and the next thing you win, you know, I mean, I mean, they're exce- I mean, this, what, there's the one guy nominated for Best Actor. I mean, this is his first feature film acting role, and he's nominated for an Oscar, and his first TV role, he was nominated for an Emmy. That's exceptional, you know. But imagine if a film festival had the film To Leslie this year, which is, you know, Andrea Risenberg got the nomination. That is a truly an indie film, you know, and the Oscars usually do not. That was actors drove that. And, you know, all of a sudden you you could have had um, an Oscar nominated feature film at a mid-level film festival, which is like a big score for a programmer. So... And the programmers judge by the quality of the program. And then, um, I think, you know, And but the hardest thing for me in doing this was I did it all for filmmakers and that once we booked your film, I felt like it was my obligation to do whatever I could to get, to get asses in the seat to see your film. And um, that was our job. So obviously you talk about getting asses in seats. What, whether it's with green light or mm-hmm. whether it's with the film programming, what are, what are things filmmakers can do to, I know, assist you, I guess. In yeah. Making, well, that's, making you can, that easier yeah, you for can, you, but also easier for them. Well, there's two, uh, for, for film festivals and towards it, I'm sure sunscreen's still doing this, but, uh, in my last year we were really connecting, um, filmmakers with, like we were connecting and linking up with Instagram because social media is really what drives, right. you know, all of that. So filmmakers who come in and will help champion uh, their film and they can find their niches and they promote it and you do cross promotion types of stuff. That's important. I think with when you have a theater and you book a film. So one of the things that um, I've noticed, I, I really don't understand why. It doesn't appear that AMC on these guys. So what you do is when you book a film at a movie theater, you usually get, depending on the distributor, a promo pack, right? So I have a poster. Some of them are exceptional where they'll have these social media. They have the quotes, the critical quotes. They already have it all ready to go, digitally ready to go stuff. Mm -hmm. And then because you're – We approach things at Greenlight trying to build an audience. Every day I wake up and I'm like, who is the audience for this film? And if they don't let me see it, I remember one film we completely misread and they didn't, Neon didn't let us see it. And after the opening night, I'm like, oh, we promoted this wrong. This isn't what this is about. Mm. And it bombed, right? And Mm. if I could have seen it, we would have shifted stuff. You try to shift, but so you're trying to sell you're trying to persuade the market to come see a film. So even with feature films, when you have, you'll see sometimes on Greenlight site with a little bit lesser big film, I'll get the actor, the director to do a, you know, or Eugenie did a thing, you know, when we did Fear of Rain or I'll get, you know, these kinds of blurbs out there to do that. So filmmakers can help market their stuff, but it's usually in collaborating with um, social media. Very cool. Um, 
But every day you wake up and during COVID, it's like people would be like, oh yeah, COVID, you know, I don't pay. I'm like, well, lucky you. Every day for two and a half freaking years, I woke up and had to think, how does what I'm reading today affect consumer behavior on whether or not to come see the movie I'm playing? Every yeah. day you wake yeah. up, how do I deal it? How do I address this? What should we do? How do I sell this? How do I sell this? How do I sell this? And you never stop. And that's the kind of hustling you have to do in an art house cinema that the big chains don't do. They just book it, shove it in there, hope that your national promo sells it, but nobody sells it locally. We have to sell locally. Right. To get people. Yeah. And you have to fill those seats for sure. Or sometimes call. AK, you got to see this film. I want you to look at the direction of that. Tell me what, you know, and that kind of thing. So you do that. Yeah. Are there any signs you see in movies? I mean, you've watched obviously from being a film programmer for festivals and then a film a programmer for Greenlight, the local theater. Are there any signs you see that you feel like you notice when it's like, I think this is going to be a, a box, like this is going to be a box office hit or it's going to be a bomb? You know, are there things you kind of, patterns you see um, with the, whether it's in indie films or in general? Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, um, my ideal scenario would be one where I get critical like 80%, 75, 80. Mm. But then that's, it- That's it, boys. If you're not above the 75, well, let's say 70, you ain't right, getting right. an Oscar. But, and then it goes to, <laughs> no, but then it goes to, to but I'll give you another one. If the critics give it a 40, I might want to shy away. But when the audiences see it, they give it a 95. So it tells me it's critically mm, marginal, but, but audience, audience hit, yeah. right? So, and when those numbers are reversed, right? So, you know, I'm watching, we got one coming and I'm watching, that's the inverse, right? <laughs> you know, um, critical, great. Yeah. But this is always the case with horror. And then it drops to 50%. Which means, uh oh, that means half my audience. That you've got to think about that. Yeah. So you look at that. The other thing too is you can tell by the audience reaction. So I knew when we showed everything everywhere all at once, and um, once I saw it with an audience, I I felt I felt the energy audience gave. And I knew, like right now we're showing living. And I'm like, yesterday, 40 people bought tickets for a two o'clock matinee. You were there. And I said to Mike, these 40 people are all going to see this film. And almost all 40 of them are going to walk out of the theater today at four o'clock. And they're going to encounter somebody and they're going to say, you have to see this film. And it's word of mouth. And that, and once I know that I have word of mouth with a film, it, it can run and I'll like, I need more shows. Right, you got to book a, this. You got to carry this. This is going to keep it helps delivering give it legs. because people will tell it. There's films that like, there were films and then there's tougher films that are hard for people. Like the very best film, in my opinion, of the entire year is by the Polish, by a Polish, 84 year old Polish director who pushed the, pushed the edges of filmmaking with a film called EO, which is nominated for best foreign language. Okay. And it was a challenging, most intellectually challenging film we had, but it was, um, you know, it was brilliant, but you don't get as much promotion after fact because right. people are like, oh, wow. They knew they saw something profound, but they didn't know if the next person could handle it, yeah. right? And so I saw that with everything everywhere, living, those kind. so you kind of know. And then, um, and then there's films that are just, you know, they're marginal, but audiences love them. So, you know, yeah, or, I mean, or anything locally with Eugene in and they'll go see it. I mean, she could just, we could make a film of her eating a pie and I think they'd buy tickets. So, you know, what well, do you think, Eugene? Obviously you were there at the, uh, with the screening of living and, you know, you saw that it was packed out and, uh, and you're kind of seeing the effect of that where you are talking about it and you're kind of helping give this movie legs in its own right. And it feels like as this is also what maybe filmmakers, like you're talking about, filmmakers need to be coming out to see these local movies and helping with this aspect of of giving it legs because it will kind of be this full circle of, right, of right. supporting these local movies, going and, and learning from indie filmmakers because that's how you want to be. Exactly. And then, and then obviously you're going to take that experience, something you liked, and, and somehow it might impact 
whether the next project you do or how you view a movie next time or or how you go and want to screen your movie next time why well, I, I when i yeah this it's a good question um like dissecting the psychology behind why someone refers a film right so when i think about yesterday's mm. you know experience was it completely the fact that it was a good film was maybe part of it the fact that it was recommended by you know uh, someone i respect maybe was it because um an older lady um told me to stop filming the screen um because she didn't like it you know and and so i had an a uh, 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 you have a memory. I, uh, I had, I, I share, I had an, an experience with a, an, a, a, you know, confused um, um, uh, audience member. Um, was it the fact that um, I'm a filmmaker myself? I mean, I think that there's, um, I, I, th I, I think probably the, the biggest indicator or the, the biggest proponent of, um, or component of referring a film is, 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 is experience. You know, did you have right. an experience? Because that's the thing with... is with art. So if you go to like, you know, if you go to look at art, people are like, I don't get it. Okay, forget it. I don't care if you get it or not. Um, what is it? They're like, oh, I like that. Okay, what does it say to you? Yeah. Well, how does it speak to you? How does it, because it, when you see, when you look at art, uh, visual art, uh, whatever genre you like, it could be pottery, ceramics, paintings, um, video art. Um, you, if you pause, you should have a visceral. You know, I remember I went and saw the Rodin exhibit at the MFA, and I just had this immediate reaction to one of the pieces. I mean, it was just you could feel how that is, and so the same thing comes true with films. Like, yeah. we see films and we like them; they make us happy, they make us laugh, but sometimes they move us, right? And so when I refer, I mean, my referral to you yesterday wasn't just that I'm trying to get the nine bucks for the theater, but it was, I wanted you as a director to see how this director took an actor who we normally see as a bumbling kind of, you know, we know him from Love Actually and all, and had him really directed him in such a constricted kind of, like he was wearing a corset, and, and then the subtext, like the whole thing comes out on camera. It was, and, and I also knew based on your personality that you would track with the theme. Mm -hmm. Like it would, it would speak to you. I could kind of tell that mm -hmm. you would eat it up. And so you refer and, um, and when some movies are challenging and filmmakers love them because they're, they're artistically challenging, they're intellectually challenging, they're thematically challenging. They hit subjects that are uncomfortable. And then there's just films that maybe inspire you to, I mean, it's the filmmaking is an art and we think of it as just something we do on Friday nights. And sometimes that's what it is. We go to see like Ratatouille popcorn, or, popcorn you know, and all, and that's fine. Whatever. But the power of filmmaking, it's an art form and Mm -hmm. um, there are films that are art films and films that all of it's art, but there's ones that are a little more heavily into the art. Yeah. And then there are technical wonders, you know, um, the fact that any film gets made, um, is remarkable. And the fact that any film gets made and will have legs to last 67, you know, Casablanca, yeah. what, 80 years is, um, it's remarkable if you've worked on a film, right? That, People didn't kill each other, that you got it done, that the funding came in, that the timing worked, that you didn't, you know. Yeah. And it's just simply, um, you know, um, yeah. But, yeah, so I don't know. I guess the referral, but the word of mouth really helps. Um, and that can just take off, yeah. Even it happens with shorts. People are like, oh, you got to see this short. Well, everyone. Are we done? Yeah. That brings us to the end of this wonderful episode of Cinedome's oh, Cinephiliac Sorry, podcast. everybody. <laughs> you, ma you made it through, Chris. You made it through. Uh, everyone, thank you for joining us today. I am your co-host, Daniel Scott DeJess, and with me... A.K. everybody. And A.K. 
I think Chris was amazing. He's in, so much better than amazing in than, this episode. He's like, I'm gonna be horror. I'm gonna have anything to talk about. This was this, this. This is not. I I watched. He was like, he wrote, wrote me this like this big p- paragraph. Don't ask me this. Big, don't do over yeah, under. Yeah. Don't do this. Yeah, and he was like, I don't think that this is gonna appeal to your. I your, might be your high. Filming. Don't ask me too much, too <laughs> fast. Yeah, and I was like, I I totally disagree. disagree. Well, the reason why was that because yeah. oftentimes filmmakers don't want to hear. Well, they, I guess they the don't want to make side, they don't right. want to make money. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I was I, I was like, I'm a, I mean we're both filmmakers and I was I was very yeah. much into this conversation. This was yeah. really great. Uh, I, I yeah I'm yeah it was I, really I, awesome just if, talking about it. it I, and I've never really had this type of conversation in terms of film festivals and, and yeah. just film programming in general. So it was really educational for me, um, and I'm sure hopefully educational to a lot of other people, but also hopefully. just very very intriguing yeah well thank you for having me yeah Yeah, thanks for being here chris and i can pontificate for 45 minutes thank you (laughs) that's great all right everyone thank you for joining us stay tuned and well hey you forgot a question if 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 people need to reach out to you come to green light see a film come to green light cinema if you're in saint petersburg support green light cinema and come see living it could change your life perfect thank you chris for being here all right everyone Thank thank you see you next episode bye